Okay, so next on the agenda, we have Adam and Berinder. These are the guys who make our lives much easier. System enhancements. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Varinder Singh, and this is Adam Raymond. And we're going to be talking about the retirement appointment reconciliation updates. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you have already noticed the updates that went in January 19th? OK. Uh, the updates that went in on January 19th? Can you hear me? There we go. How about now? A little bit better? OK. Um, so yeah, so we had updates go in January 19th. How many of you have noticed those updates to our pages? OK, well, we'll be going over those, and hopefully we can answer some of your questions. Um, our objectives for this presentation, uh, we're going to share the system enhancements. So we'll be talking about the synchronized data on both the payroll schedules and the retirement appointment reconciliation pages and how that's going to be beneficial to you. Uh, Adam's going to go over a process on how to manage the retirement appointment reconciliation pages. And we'll be talking about the business partner on leave report as well. That's a report that captures all of the participants that are in the on-leave status. So what is retirement appointment reconciliation? Overall, it's a process that helps you to reconcile participants' appointments. You can separate participants, you can put them on leave, you can end the leave, and you can confirm unposted payroll. By a show of hands, how many of you have access to the payroll schedules pages? OK, and how many have access to only the retirement appointment reconciliation page and not the payroll schedule? Well, now school districts and county school offices have access to both. Well, not access to both, I'm sorry, but they can view the same data as both pages. So you'll be able to see future earned periods and not just past due periods on the retirement appointment reconciliation pages. We added new filters and columns, so you can filter for um, by earned periods if you want to look at a specific earned period. Um, per your recommendations, we also excluded those participants that are in the on-leave status for the first six months and those that have an end-leave date entered. And once again, we'll be covering the business partner on-leave report as well. I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Verinder. Um, I'm looking at your slides, and the images are a little small. Um, so the next few slides, what we wanted to do is just walk through the actual updates that we've been uh, that we've made that you'll see on the pages. I'm sure, uh, based on the hands, that you've probably seen some of these changes already and are somewhat familiar with them. So the first page that we're going to cover is the retirement appointment reconciliation page. Um, what I'll try to do is I'll try to go down the page in the updates from kind of a top to bottom, left to right um, fashion. So the first change that's been added is the retired annuitant indicator. Um, we're hopeful at this point you guys are familiar with that. If, if this is new, then I'm glad we're here giving an update. Um, so that filter itself is a yes, no, and it'll allow you to quickly identify your re uh, retired annuitant appointments for your employees. To the right of that, we've added a payroll past due filter. Um, this was added to accommodate the data synchronization uh, where we're now displaying current earn periods. Um, so that filter, again, is yes, no. Where we're saying payroll past due, if you select yes, that represents any of your employees that have at least one earn period that's past its payroll reporting date. Um, if you select no, then the expectation is you're going to just see employees who are essentially current. And what we're flagging right now is just the current earn period. So I think if a lot of you were logged in today, you would probably see, I think the majority are monthly pay schedules. Um, right now, you should be seeing January's earn period on this page. And that, that I believe, is not actually due until March 2nd in our system. Um, so moving down to the next section, um, and actually, I'll pause for a second here. Um, so when Vrinder asked that question about you guys having access to just the retirement appointment reconciliation page, um, we're hopeful that you guys were aware that your school districts, that is, the, from, from this effort specifically, that's the only page that they can see if they do not report payroll. So I don't know if everyone was aware of that fact. Um, so, so the challenge that we were faced with was trying to allow, and based on feedback we received from uh, county offices, we were trying to uh, create a way for districts to get the current uh, earned period information so that they could help with these efforts. And so we've done that with this update that went in January. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk through kind of how the districts can view that information now on this page. 
So where we have that uh, yellowish orange box for payroll schedule type, um, if, if you're a monthly payroll reporting agency only, if that's your only pay schedule, by default, when you land on this page, it should automatically be set to monthly. Um, and then to the right of that, there's a fiscal year uh, column, which will allow you to select which fiscal year you want to look at. And then the, the box that we want to point out here is the earn period. Uh, right now, in this image on the screen, it's, that filter is collapsed. Um, to be able to access this earn period dropdown, you'll have to select a payroll schedule type and a fiscal year. Once you do that, you'll notice on the screen that earn period window will expand, and you'll have the option to select uh, based on your actual individual earn periods. So we're trying to mimic the payroll schedule page, which um, our expectation is you're probably pretty familiar at this point with that page. Um, but this, from a district standpoint, this would be how your school districts that don't report payroll would see it and be able to access that uh, same information. And so that's where we say that the information is synchronized. This is how um, your districts would look at that. Um, so moving down to the last or the bottom portion of the page that's titled Participants with Unposted Payroll, we've added a number of appointments indicator in this section. The neat thing with this feature is it's going to allow you, as you're applying filters on the page, it's going to, um, in real time, give you ac actual counts of how many employees uh, meet those filter parameters. So for example, if in this scenario you filter just retired annuitants and you had 30, that, that uh, indicator should say 30. That would be what you'd see there. So we felt like that would be valuable to you as users um, to kind of have an idea of how many employees were meeting certain parameters that you were selecting. Um, and so I will, I'm sorry, and there's a couple other things here. Uh, there's been a couple columns that were added and then some naming, naming convention changes. Uh, the first we'll cover is that payroll pass due. We talked about it in the middle section of the page where we have that drop down filter. This column will kind of correspond with that filter itself. It'll let you know if the participant has payroll pass due, yes or no. And then to the right of that is the unposted payroll periods. That previously was titled missing payroll periods. Uh, we've updated that to just accommodate the fact, again, that we're showing both current earned periods that aren't due yet and past due periods. So that was the, the justification kind of for us behind the naming convention change. Uh, so the next page we're going to walk into is you would access the next page by clicking the checkbox to the left of one of your employees, um, the participant CalPERS ID. So there's that checkbox on the left there. Um, before I go to that page, if you have multiple, and I'm sure some of you are familiar, if you have multiple participants that you want to maintain their enrollment for, you can check multiple boxes at the same time, and that'll queue up those selected participants on this next page. So I'll go to that page. So this is the maintain enrollment page. Uh, I thank you guys for bearing with me. I think that first page is the one that had the most updates. Uh, over the next couple of pages that we covered, there's not quite as many. Um, on the maintain enrollment page, Essentially what we've done, anywhere where you see those orange boxes, um, we've, we've tried to move uh, specific individual participant information down so that it's in a central location. So where you see member category, enrolled in health, and then the appointment start date. Previously that information was in that upper um, section of the page that said maintain appointment event history. So our goal here was just to try to make it easier for you all to have the information right in front of you in one spot. And then the last thing is that save and go to next button at the bottom of this page. Um, you'll notice on this, in this example, we have three, three employees queued up. So what we're saying is we're wanting to maintain enrollment for three individual employee appointments. Once you reach that last appointment um, on this page, um, so in this example, it's Carcella Janssen, I believe is the name. Uh, that, that button, save and go to next, will actually change and say save and return. Um, so once you click that, on that last participant save and return, that's going to take you back to the page where you access the maintain enrollment page from. OK. So going back to the retirement appointment reconciliation, the other uh, function that you, or ability you guys have on this page is to confirm unposted payroll periods. To do that, you would uh, select a participant and click that blue review link. And that'll take you to this review and confirm unposted payroll page. All the changes here are down in that bottom portion of the page. Um, there's, we've added a lot more details that weren't there previously. I think previously there were maybe three columns. Uh, 
So the big ones to point out, we added a column for payroll due date. Um, we're hope, hoping this will kind of be useful as well. Previously, that wasn't there. You were able to see the earn period begin and end date. Now you can actually see that payroll due date, which kind of informs you for the ones that aren't due yet, when they will become due, and then when they'll become past due. In the example on the screen, we, uh, we've provided an example where this specific participant has pay both payroll that is past due, and you can see toward the bottom, there's a few earn periods that we're saying no, they're not yet past due. Um, I will point out this screenshot was earlier in January, so I know <laughs> you may see some of the due dates have already come and gone, and, and our indicators say no. So, so that's kind of an update on all the changes that have been made, or actually, I'm sorry, I'm just skipping one. <laughs> Okay, so the payroll schedule page, the big addition here was uh, the Excel and print function buttons are now on the page. So for, for the, obviously for your county office of education, you have a lot of employees. Um, you now can uh, press that Excel button and view those in an Excel format. And you also can use the uh, print function which will allow you to print basically kind of a screen view of the list of participants. When you use the print function, it's kind of like the web page view, so that's, just so you guys have a heads up what it will look like when you press that button. And then the last thing here is at the very bottom of the page, uh, we've added a return link here as well that wasn't there and I think it caused you to have to kind of go through the same process to get into that page. So, so at this point, we've been talking for a little bit. I'll, I'll go ahead and pause and see if there's any questions up, up till now. We have one over. Juanita Lopez, Sacramento County Schools. Can you tell me what is, and excuse my ignorance with this, but what is the, what, what's the benefit for having the current earned period that is not due yet on this schedule because it's caused a lot of confusion? Right, no, it's a, it's a really good question. So um, the goal here is obviously we, we recognize that the first couple weeks like right after your earn period ends, you're, you're, you're gonna be seeing every employee, right? Um, the hope is the day after your payroll posts, that list should be reduced by whoever had payroll received for that earn period. Um, the, the one thing that we touched on a little bit is this, this allows your districts to help with the effort. So our, from a process standpoint, we're hoping that you guys, as you're posting payroll, you can begin notifying your districts, hey, payroll for this earn period's posted, um, we need you to start helping us go in and account for these remaining participants that did not have payroll for that earned period. Um, and and I, I understand your question too. I think in a perfect world, our process, what we would do is we would wait until you posted the payroll report and then this list of, yeah, and <laughs> a perfect world, I, I think ultimately that would be ideal. Um, that itself is challenging and the reason for that, I mean, is we, we see a lot of payroll that's up to the very last minute, right? Like the day before that end date. So at the end of, when we, right after we posted December, we go in and do our confirming and, and do the appointment reconciliation. And we went from like 200 to 14,000 because there was January in there. January is not due until later. So we right. have all of those people showing on the appointment reconciliation and the districts trying to go through and trying to figure out why they had so much. And when you called member service, they had no idea what we were talking about. So okay. it was kind of just misleading. No, and, and, we, and I think it's expected. It's gonna take us a little bit of time to get familiar with these pages. Um, I will say to that same point, the, the quickest way to filter that out is to, to use that uh, payroll pass due filter. Um, and we'll have, and, and our team, will, we'll give you our email. You can have the districts feel free to reach out to us. I mean, I, we recognize that it's gonna be a training process with, with your districts as well, so. Hi, I'm Tony Carlson, and I'm a manager over Brenda and Adam. One of the main reasons that we did this also is due to the retired annuitants and the potential for late reporting fees. Um, so this is to help a lot of times the districts will know before you whether or not uh, payroll is going to be, you know, if these individuals work or not. So they can go in and they can confirm that the person did not work and that will help avoid the fees that are being assessed, which is the $200 per pay period for late reporting. Um, and then based on feedback that we received throughout the last year is there was a lot of complaints that districts couldn't see current data 
um, as as a, as the COEs, and especially in summer months when people are not working, um, we're trying to develop ways that's going to help process, you know, help with those types of things. Okay, thank you. Hi, Vina from Orange County. <laughs> um, since you are enhancing this, that's very nice. So one other suggestion is that, you know how when we re receive the late retiree fees, and if we go and post it here, no payroll reported, if it can be linked to those charges so they are waived? You okay. understand what I'm saying? I, I think I do. Okay. Um, and I'll try to talk to you as well more about it. I think I understand, yeah, you want to, Try to link yeah, the once reports. We, yeah, once we receive it and we go and we post that there was no payroll for those periods, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure it gets waived. It's linked to that those charges. Okay. That we receive. No, that's good feedback. Yeah, we'll, okay, thank we'll you. take that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, move on here. One more question. Go ahead. Yes, yes, we do. And we have the resources. We'll be posting them at the end of our presentation. The new one was just uploaded. Yes. Today. Yes. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Um, so some, a couple key takeaways that we want to go over. So again, what we just discussed the up-to-date, unposted payroll period information. So this is an example of what a district can now see. Um, so just really high level, if they, they can filter down to, they can select a pay schedule, the current fiscal year, and then an earned period. And then that way they can see those participants that have that earned period that's on the Retirement Employment Reconciliation page. So again, it's just another method of helping the districts help you to reconcile these appointments. Another thing we wanted to talk about was that, um, and you may or may not have noticed this, um, the larger agencies may have noticed this, but the pages will show the first 1,000 participant records. If you look at that first circled yellow box, it says showing 1 to 25 of 1,000 entries. And right above that, you see it says show 25 entries. What you can do is use that drop down to view up to 500 entries on the page. Um, so that's one way to see more information on the page. Um, you can use that um, search for participants to reconcile tab. We have it minimized right now, but you can use that to filter down if you just wanted to view retired annuitants, those participants on leave, or even just an individual, you can type in their CalPERS ID or SSN. So you'll want to use those filters in order to capture a certain population. Yes? It used to be view all. We no longer get Right. So this was done because, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of data on the pages now. And so to avoid long page load times, this was done. To, um, but again, we can still capture the population that you want. You, we'll just need to utilize the filters. Yeah. All right, Adam's going to talk about kind of a high-level method of managing the retirement appointment reconciliation process. All right, so with the graphic you guys see on the slide right now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to capture the actual current month that we're in from an earned period perspective. So on the left-hand side of the timeline that you'll see on this slide, um, we're saying February 1st, the earned period begins. Uh, February 28th, the earned period ends for this monthly schedule. Um, below, you'll see those shapes. Um, ideally, what we're, what we're hoping and we're um, working to, striving towards is getting your earned period report posted roughly within the first couple weeks of the month. Um, what that's going to do, and, and, and I see head nods a little bit, and. This is where we're not as familiar probably with your processes from a payroll standpoint. Um, again, this is what we're striving towards. Um, so the earlier payroll is posted, that expands that reconciliation window that you'll see there in that shape next to post payroll. Um, and for this example, we're saying March 30th, the earned period report is due to CalPERS. And then as of that date and beyond, that's when payroll for this specific earned period becomes past due. And that's where any, if there is applicable fees, that's when they would potentially be assessed. So the big takeaway here with this timeline that we wanted to say again and, and, and to just try to reinforce is 
is we're hopeful from a process standpoint that you guys can begin delegating some of this effort to your uh, non-payroll reporting school districts, so that's districts that you're reporting payroll on their behalf. Um, from a process standpoint, again, if there would be some way to develop just a notification system, letting them know the day that payroll is posting so that they can assist and go in that very next day and start accounting for the remaining employees that we're saying are still, still did not have payroll for that period. So is there any question with the visual here? Yeah. <laughs> that all of the unposted um, payrolls have to be confirmed before the um, report is due or the file is due? For, for this specific earn period, that's what, yes. Okay, so um, is this for, where the projected contribution inputs would be generated after this period? Um, when that functionality is turned on it would this would this timeline will be useful for that process yes That's yeah the intention for it. we're getting yeah we're getting there where where the, yes yeah i mean ultimately i more than that though i mean besides that process and the projections the, the goal here is for us is to let you know we're, we're at a point now where the districts um can begin helping with this effort where up to this point i think you guys have been managing it kind of single-handedly um so our hope is that Event, it'll hopefully help save some work. We, we recognize that this is an effort in itself. But yeah, good question. <laughs> All right. So also with the uh, system updates that went in in the middle of January, we added a new Cognos report. It's called the Business Partner on Leave Report. This report itself, what it's gonna do is it's gonna provide you a list of all your employees that currently have an appointment in an on-leave status. Um, so we wanted to just share that with you and make you aware that this report is available. And then on the page itself, we have uh, some of our resources here. Sorry, there's one in the student guidance section. There's one that actually the name is, is not correct any longer. Um, I think it's that second bullet, the Mike Helpers, or no, I'm sorry, the first one, the, it's the payroll contribution reporting. I believe that student guide's name now is just Mike Helpers payroll reporting. So I just wanted to note that as well on the resources page. And to reach our team, you can use that email address that's on the page here. Um, and so that was kind of the intent with Verinda and I presenting today. You can actually see our faces of the team that's working on this effort specifically. We'll go ahead and open up for any additional questions there may be. Awesome. Thank you. Oh. Um, we see a lot of unposted uh, records for employees, but it's for a different payroll cycle than the one that they're on. Do you have a like estimated date as to when that will be fixed? because the districts are spending a lot of time, you know, going back to reconcile and they're coming across all these earned period dates that don't apply to them. Right, are you at Riverside County Schools? Okay, yeah, we, we do have updates um, happening again, I believe in April. We're, we're, we're looking to address the multiple payroll schedule. Um, I, I think you're one of just a couple county offices that have that, but yeah, we are, we are looking at um, implementing new rules and we can, work with you guys specifically to try to explain those, if, if that makes sense, if that works. Um, Thank you. Yeah. This is Sheila Walker, Tana County Department of Ed. You, you're probably not the person to answer this, but do you guys have a date in mind when you're going to be turning on the assessments for schools for the regular employees? Um, yeah, you're, I think you're right in that question. Um, from a functionality standpoint, it's we're there. Uh, I, I can't provide That's you. Scared me. I can't provide you the date. I, I do imagine, and I, I believe that we will send out either a circular letter or some type of communication, letting you, letting the schools know. Um, yeah. Hi, good morning. 
Um, I'm Jonathan Hensley over at Pension and Health Accounting. Um, the ability to um, project on contributions is built into the system. Currently, the schools are not turned on um, with the new retirement annuity fee and other functionality that's been coming on. We've been putting it off. We'll be looking at examining how schools are reporting what the fee structure looks like and everything prior to turning on projections. We don't want to just compound fee after fee after fee. So it will be coming. Uh, an exact date is not set right now, but it would probably be towards the beginning of the next fiscal year. Cool. I think we're good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you all. OK, next up is Tim Herbeck with Reciprocal Member Payroll Breakdown. Andy brought his law book. <clears throat> or as I like to call it, my companion pet. <laughs> or I also call it my sleep aid. One of those two. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Well, thank you very much for having me again. It's been a while since I presented, so I feel like I'm back at home with all of you schools. Um, today I'm going to be presenting on the reciprocal compensation request process. Um, for the most part, I think many of you are aware of kind of how the reciprocity process works when someone retires, but I wanted to kind of give you a high-level overview of how what, or what my team does when we get these reciprocal requests and how we partner with STRS as well as partner with you. So in today's presentation, we're going to be going over the CalPERS reciprocal process. Um, I'll talk about the actual salary request form that's filled out by STRS, generally speaking. Um, I'll talk a little bit why the breakdown of components is so essential for us to make a determination timely. And then most of you already know how to contact me, but I'll give you some resources on how to contact us. Um, before I go into this process, I want to let you know that over the last six months, CalPERS has engaged in a number of meetings um, to work with a lot of our reciprocal systems to get a better understanding of what is required from them when they place a person into retirement and the compensation they use to calculate the retirement benefits versus what's required from us in order to put somebody on roll correctly and accurately. Uh, we met with STRS and our counterparts and I think we fostered a very good relationship with them in regards to having a better understanding of the process, not only the intake of the forms identifying the retirement dates, but also why it's important for us to have a more thorough a review of compensation reported by schools to STRS and kind of get a better understanding of what their processes are for the intake. Um, one of the things that I know all of you know as well as I know is that STRS is a little different in how they allow you to report your compensation to them for your certificated teachers and those who elect to stay with STRS versus um, the very non-complex method for which CalPERS requires you to report payroll to us, right? I mean, if it was easy, we wouldn't need my sleep aid right here which clearly defines what's reportable and not reportable to CalPERS. So one of the things we found out is that when we used to contact STRS directly to say, hey, you know, somebody is retiring from our system, they have established reciprocity, so they're retiring concurrently with you at STRS, they would just give us the, um, what we call a final average compensation amount on a monthly basis, and that's kind of what we would use. The problem that, with that is that a lot of times that monthly average includes items of additional benefits or special compensation that is reported uh, to STRS on behalf of some of the districts and yourself as a county office. And then once we get a better understanding of what actually is reported to CalPERS, just like you are aware when we contact you for our determinations, some of those items of special compensation or even the hourly equivalent rates are not reportable to CalPERS but can be reported to STRS. Unfortunately, um, as of today, STRS, and I know they're embarking on a huge project to get a little bit more information, they don't have you technically identify, just like we didn't years ago, right? Before it was a code six, you would just tell us how much special comp. It was never an identifiable item. With my CalPERS, we're a little bit more stringent and strict on what we have you report. So we have you identify a special comp. Um, today, STRS doesn't do that. I know they're looking at possibly going that route, but until then, um, we really can't depend wholeheartedly on the compensation that they give us as a final average comp. And so what we agreed to do is instead of constantly working with through STRS is to go to the actual source and you are the source or your districts are the source. And so we will now start going through and some of you may have already got emails 
from our um, reciprocal mailbox that we manage, saying these are some new breakdowns and requirements we have in order to calculate timely. Um, and so I have received feedback. It's like, why are we all of a sudden getting these emails? Why are you asking for this? Um, why we've never provided you that before? And as soon as we start to get those type of emails, I figured, hey, it's probably best for me to make an appearance to all of you and talk to you about the process. So this is the process. CalPERS will receive the retirement application uh, on our retirement application. So someone walks into our regional office, they say I'm retiring on the form. They also say I have reciprocal relationship with STRS. I'm you know, retiring also with STRS, they get the retirement date. So our benefits office will receive that information. Um, they will then reach out and send out a form to STRS or whatever reciprocal agency the person is retiring from saying these are the components we need you to review. That agency will then fill out that form. A lot of times they just, like I said, give us the final average compensation and send it back. Um, we are now also receiving things through our reciprocal salary request form uh, mailbox. So the reciprocal salary request form comes back. There are a lot of data elements that are on it um, that we review and look in order to make a proper determination. Once we receive that form, a lot of times we will reach back out to you because we have to make sure that the compensation, the pay rate of earnings, meet the requirements that are set out in our PEARL, as well as a special compensation that's reported is set out in our California Code of Regulations. As Soon as we gather all the determination doc or required documentations, my team today will go ahead and do a, uh, a review of all the information, and then we will make a determination. We'll send it back down to the benefits office, saying here's what the full-time monthly pay rate is, here's the allowable special comp. They will then hopefully do their, or their uh, calculation timely, and we will set that retiree on to Hawaii or wherever they're planning on going vacation. And we no longer have to deal with them. So that's kind of a high level overview of the process. Now this form I talked about has been changed a number of times. Um, we actually just made a couple of small edits to it recently and so the form looks like this, where we actually now require the reciprocal system to provide a position title. Uh, for STRS, this is one of the challenges because in your current enrollment process, just like with CalPERS and your payroll reporting process, just like CalPERS, you don't tell us what the position titles are. So the only resource we have will be you as a county office or your districts. So a lot of times the position title isn't always clearly defined. We have the effective date, the date of membership, the type of service if they're miscellaneous or safety. We know whether or not it's on a disability application, what type of disability, and does the final average compensation, or FAC, uh, include special compensation? A lot of times this is a checkbox of no, um, but then we do get times where it's checked no that it doesn't include special comp, but we get the breakdown and it does have special comp components in it. So we have to do a little bit further review. Then we ask you whether or not the review period's a one year or a three year, and are they subject to PEPRA and provide any additional comments? One of the other changes we have is for the reciprocal system, that we now want them to sign it, print their name, date it, um, but we also need a telephone number and email address in order to send back inquiries if we have to. For STRS, um, we know they have one person that sends out this form and we've already committed to now reaching out to the district's contacts, the county office's contacts, instead of directly back with them. For all other reciprocal systems, it's a little easier because they're the ones that manage the data directly. Um, for a disability retirement, there's a, just a little bit difference in the first sheet. Uh, we do ask for the approved disability benefit type. What would your system pay if the member had so many years of service and then also does it include the FAC? Uh, so if it is a disability retirement, the form is just a slightly different, but many of the same components are the same. So um, going into why is CalPERS asking for a breakdown of components? Uh, we did send out a circular letter, but generally speaking, we have to ensure that we're in compliance with Government Code 20221 and with PEPRA under California Code of Regulations Title 2579.24, which is a reciprocal retirement system shall provide the following. We definitely need a breakdown of compensation components, which shows a pay rate, earnings, and special comp. We need the salary schedule that you have publicly made available on your website, or uh, if it's for a prior year, possibly retained for no less than five years, or you'll have to go back to your archives and try to dig it out. Um, and also a written labor agreement or policy, uh, better known generally as an MOU, which can clarify exactly what the requirements are for reporting special comp. 
Um, I know I was just talking with Claudette, a lot of times you guys call things a special comp differently than what this lovely book here calls it. But the descriptions provided in this book and on our website should help you kind of be able to match what those items of special compensation are because it clearly defines what it is even if our names don't match. But that's why a labor agreement or MOU is very handy for us because we can look at what the intent is when you entered into labor agreements um, with you know, your bargaining groups to say this is the intent of say longevity pay or education incentive or anything else. Uh, so failure to provide a breakdown of compensation will delay uh, the person's ability to retire timely, which we don't want to do. We want to send that person on to Hawaii timely and happy, right? Uh, when we go past the retirement date and they miss that first paycheck and they're starting to call us, that's when they get a little um, irked, I guess you can say. They don't generally like us as much when we don't give them their money timely. Uh, and generally, our only answer is, is that we can't define what was reported because we don't have a salary schedule or MOUs. So we really ask that you send it to us timely because if we don't get it timely and we're past the retirement date, we do have the ability to calculate the retirement benefit using CalPER salaries. And um, for many of you, that could be somebody who worked at your agency in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, we make a little bit more now than we did back then, right? Uh, nobody wants their retirement calculated on a $10 an hour pay rate when they currently make like $40 an hour. Uh, we will call the member and let them know. Unfortunately, we were unable to obtain required documentation from the reciprocal system or the employer, and we are going to place you on roll using a $10 an hour pay rate. Sometimes they're not happy with that, but um, you know, in order to ensure they get their health benefits and their retirement checks timely, that's kind of what we have to do. Uh, however, we will definitely work with you more diligently and upfront. So hopefully this conversation now kind of spurs a little bit more of an importance when we do send those emails out to you asking for these components, you have a better understanding why. Um, for more information regarding these government codes and our um, ability to calculate the retirement using uh, the final average comp of CalPERS salaries, we do have circular 200-009-18 that was sent out in February 2018 that clearly defines all our requirements and our abilities to do so. So contacting CalPERS, CalPERS were sent a, a follow-up email requesting required documentation. As I said, one of the processes we recently put in place is that as our um, staff receive these salary request forms, they are going to look at the entire components. And if they find anything missing, they'll send you out an email. Uh, they'll sometimes do it directly to the districts. I have instructed them to try to do it to the districts as well as the county office because a lot of times you as a county office can help guide them along a little faster than a districts would generally work. Uh, some districts are really good at giving us the information. So we just wanna make sure um, we're transparent to both entities saying this is what we need. So we'll send out an email just saying, hey, within the next five days we require this documentation. Um, you do have five days to respond. Even if you can't get it to us timely, please don't just ignore the email. I mean, I have kids that ignore me already enough at home. I don't prefer having employers also ignore me. So if you can just give us, hey, Tim, this is, we understand you need this information. It's going to take us 10 days to go back to our vaults to get you know, these archived documents. Um, that'll be sufficient. It's just when we don't get a reply back that all of a sudden additional emails and follow-up calls can come in. Um, and as I said, if we don't get any documentation, we do have the right to put them on roll with CalPERS salaries. We do have a reciprocal mailbox. It's the compensation reciprocal cases at calpers.ca.gov mailbox. This is a new mailbox we have. So if you have any questions regarding reciprocity uh, compensation for calculation, you can send it to here. But just know that's the mailbox that most of these requests will come out. That being said, that's our whole overview process of our new kind of reciprocal determination. Um, putting on people on roll, making sure they're enjoying their vacations. Do any of you guys have any questions regarding this new process? Awesome. All right. I believe I'm the last presenter, right? So now I'm going to switch gears because I understand um, Brad told me I had to. Um, <laughs> I believe there was a question submitted in regards to longevity pay. Who submitted that question? Nobody. Somebody submitted a question. They wanted us to talk about longevity pay and whether or not it can be included in pay rate. Is that, I think, Sutter or Sonoma? Do any of you guys have any concerns or questions regarding 
how you guys list longevity pay on a salary schedule and whether or not it can be included in pay rate. Huh? Well, um, the answer is you can't, which I'm assuming most of it, since you guys are like, oh, we don't have any problems with this is that thing. So um, our team, and I can kind of just tell you a little bit of history, where we're at, and maybe kind of elaborate on a few other things if time permits. Um, generally what we see is we'll see a salary schedule. And I know over since the Ed Forum, um, especially some of uh, the comp review leads, the, the experts, I would say they know a lot more than I do, have engaged in a number of conference calls in regards to how to um, build your salary schedule that's posted online. And generally when we see your salary schedule, there are um, a addendum or bullet points on the very bottom that states uh, for a person who works 10 years, they'll get 5% longevity pay. A person who works 15%, they'll get an additional 7%. The problem is, is that when we see that, the pay rates that are actually being reported into MyCalPERS have that 5%, 7%, 10% already built into the pay rate. And so when we go to match, and as I've told some of you over the phone, I should be able to print a transaction sheet, hand it to anybody off the streets. They should be able to go to your website and go, this pay rate matches that pay rate. In this case, they don't, right? Because the pay rate you're reporting to us is greater than the pay rate that's on your salary schedules and it's because it includes longevity pay. Um, right now, uh, in the past, it might have been something that we, we overlooked, but I know as the last two or three years, it's been some, something we definitely want to address. Um, and we work with a lot of you to correct. And so we just wanna make sure you're aware that pay rate cannot include any items of special compensation. It cannot include any additional benefit conversions. No items of special compensation can be included pay rate. It has to be solely pay rate. Um, so that's that on longevity pay. There's no questions. I heard I had to come up yes, here and talk about longevity pay. There's a question on, um, in, the, in the mailbox, and it said, is there a government code that requires it to be reported a certain way? Well, government code, and my lovely pearl that I just got three days ago, the pages are starting to fall out. Um, so in 20636.1, um, there it states that uh, C, I don't even know how to read these things. I think it's uh, B, C, uh, items of special compensation have to report it separately from pay rate. So report each item of special compensation separately from pay rate. It's clearly written in 20636.1. So in that case, if you are paying longevity pay, it has to be sent over to us as a line item for special compensation with the defined category and type of longevity pay uh, broken out. So if it's 5% of your total earnings, you just calculate what that 5% is and that's amount would be reported as special compensation. Any other questions? Yes. Can you build multiple salary schedules? So say you have one that is base plus 5% or base plus 7% and those are all published rather than... And, and, and well, the longevity is still built into it, but it's just a, a separate schedule from base. No, because in order to have it, you have to have, that's the requirements that only a select few people based on tenure get that salary schedule. And so now it's not available to the entire group of class. And we would start to lean on other types of government codes that states that um, you can't have it specific with additional criteria in order to get there. It just has to be flat pay rate. I know we have seen salary schedules where it says, you know, a um, administrative assistant has a range one through five and their pay rate is $40, say, through $55. But then all of a sudden we'll have an administrative assistant who is a 10-year, 15-year, and 20-year employee has a different pay rate. As soon as we see that you've had put on additional criteria, uh, uh, um, conditions, then it no longer is pay rate. It has additional benefits or conditions converted into it. That has to be reported as special compensation. Yes. Is it restructure where you have staff? Well, no. Like if, you, if you're like, okay, for the first five years, yeah, exactly. I mean, you'd be like, you move them to the step 10 when they get to 10 years, and that step has that increase. So it's you no longer long and skip 10 all the way to 25. Well, I mean, if you have step one through 10 today, and also, or one through nine today, and you want, and, and every step has a 2% increase, and it's consistent across the board, and all of a sudden you want to create a step 10 
for people who've worked 10 years, as long as it's a 2% step increase, similar to everybody who's available, you know, anybody who can earn it, then yeah, but if all of a sudden you go from step nine and then you do a 10% increase because they meet 10 years and you put it, now there's other conditions and it's not consistent. So we would look at that and probably deny it. So we would want to see consistency across the board. And we do see people who have salaries steps from like one to forty nine. Are we required to have equal percent step increases? I don't believe so, no. Then it would just be something we would look at if there's a language that says because a lot of times we'll see in your MOU language where you will call out a certain percentage of increase for tenured employees. So in your MOU it'll say people who get to a ten year range will receive an additional ten percent. But then we'll go to your salary schedule, and we can now clearly see that that yeah, percentage is converted over. Restructure the whole yeah. thing. Labor agreement. We were trying to simplify, could yes. get there. You want to answer that? So, what was the question again? Yeah, I think is, could you restructure your salary schedule in order to allow for a 10-year and a 15-year person to get uh, a different pay rate if you also restructure your labor agreements and not call out a different component or bonus by reaching 10 or 15 years? I mean, we want to look at everything beforehand and need to just answer offhand on a hypothetical without actually looking at it. But, you know, long story short is if you have a longevity pay, it has to be in your labor agreement or MOU. It can't be a side note on your pay schedule. It can't be built into the pay schedule and extra step. Like you're talking about with consistent pay increases, someone's getting 2% every year after they reach a year. That's fine. But it's, it's all hinging upon how long someone's working there. 10 years and they get a huge bump after that 10 years and that has to be separated out. Does that answer the question? I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's not giving in in the past. Yeah, we, we're a little bit more lenient on that. And oftentimes it does try to be a wash on your calculation. But to be compliant with the law, you have to have it separated out. And it's a guaranteed audit finding every time if they find that. We've seen quite a few of those. And the requirements to make those corrections, you have to go back to at least the scope period. So that can be really costly on your end to have to make all those corrections. Now, if we happen to see some of these where it does try to be a wash and a calculation, yes, we will work with you, and we probably won't do a denial at first, but if we continuously see the bad reporting, then yeah, we might have to, do, to go down that road of the denials. So both of you keep referring to a large jump. I think you both used examples of like a 10% increase after 10 years okay. or something. But in most of our cases, I think it's the same type of jump. It's maybe a 5% raise for the first five years. And then that's where you would reach technically the top of the salary schedule. And on your 10th year, you would get another 5%. And then maybe on your 15th year, another 5%. And so why you might consider that longevity, it's really the salary schedule kind of slows down as they reach the top of it. And so it's not some big, huge jump. Right. It just kind of slows down when you get into those so years of service in the out years. Are they considered step increases then? Well, they're on the salary schedule, and, and they're based on technically years of service because you're not eligible for those particular columns until those particular years. Yeah. Is it in your labor agreement that if you hit those 10 years, then you get this percentage? You would be on that row and column you would reach that column at those years of service. But does your labor agreement specifically say that you have like a longevity pay and it says if you hit 10 years, you get this percentage, 15 years, you get this percentage, does it have it listed in there? I, I can't speak to what yeah. it exactly says, but I know that after years of these many years of service, you would reach those columns. Yeah, well, it we'd have to look at it. Um, you know, it can be a little bit tricky because there is kind of a, sometimes a gray line between what's longevity pay and what's just a step increase. So everybody's MOU, labor agreement, pay schedules are a little bit different. Um, so if you wanted us to review it, we do have a mailbox, MOU underscore review at calpers.ca.gov, and we can take a look at it and let you know if it's a longevity or if it's just a simple step increase. Um, sounds like in this case it would be considered a longevity pay because it's tied to a certain amount of threshold on your years. But I wanna, I'd want to look at it first to tell you 
for a fact. And we're not saying it's not reportable because it is reportable. It's just that we need it separated from the pay rate. It can't be all pay rate. It has to be pay rate with a special comp line. It, it right, might. and so that's why I want to clarify because it would change the way we do business. Okay. Because we'd have to have all new salary schedules that exclude those extra columns and pay that extra okay. amount separately, differently. Um, so it would just, it would be a huge change. That's why we'd like to clarify sure. that. Um, send and, it into our mailbox and we can take a look. And I know um, in your case, we have actually reviewed and denied that type of salary increase step. Go ahead. I'm saying I, I know in looking at recent cases that we have denied um, a cri criteria which is a salary increase goes for a person for like ever upon their anniversary they can move up through the ranges but then they hit a, a, a um, the end of the step range right it's one through five they stop at five but then all of a sudden you put on a cri uh, criteria that an only in order to get the next step increase, they have to work 10 years And in, in order to do it. As soon as you put additional criteria on that a person has to work 10 years in order to reach this, it's not available to everybody in a group of class. And so even though we may say it's a salary and not part of longevity, we would look to those rules to deny that because now you have put set criteria on only people who work 10 years and only people who work 15 years would be eligible to get the salary increase, and now you're not giving it to everybody that's part of that classification for which you bargain for. Because everybody can make it from range one to range five. They just have to they work, you know, they have to work through that. But you have a gap of, range 10, just like but you have to be, five. you have a stop at year five, and all of a sudden only people 10 and only people 15, because that's a component, and generally that's longevity. I mean, truly that's longevity pay. In order to hit 10, 15, or 20 years, that's longevity, that's the definition of longevity pay, and that's a component of special compensation, and it has that's to be broken where, out. Where I, I have this issue with, I feel like column two is longevity too, that was your second year, and then column three is your third year. It is all based on years. But those can be considered step increases as well. We just have to look at it in more detail, I believe, to make a true call on it. You know, another thing too is, you know, you're talking about having 10 steps, does everyone always come in at step one? Because here's the thing is, with longevity, it says, usually it's tied to, you work five years, you get this percentage. You work 10 years, you get this percentage. But if people come in at range five, and then they work to that 10th year, and then they don't get the bump because they don't have 10 years, then that's longevity pay. But if they start at range five and work five years and get that bump like you're talking about, that's not longevity. That's considered like your regular step increases. Normally though, we see consistency on those step increases. And if we saw it was like a 5% to a 20%, just making something up, um, that would probably raise eyebrows with us, we'd probably dive into a little more deeper. But I see that quite a bit with these longevity pays. People don't always come in at the same range and end up getting it even though they haven't worked the 10 years or whatever the threshold is. I think Vina had a question too. Oh, okay. That some people, they start at range five. Oh, yes. So they don't get it. So it won't be same treatment. So you already said that. I like when Bina and I are sympathetic. <laughs> 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 but if you want us to review the MOU or your pay schedules, anybody in here, we have that mailbox. It's a common thing we do. We, we love to review it because we don't want to set you down the wrong path and have to, you know, deny something that you're intending to report or have to go through an audit, we have to make a bunch of corrections. Okay. Brad, we do have a comment that you might wanna comment on. In essence, longevity would be needed to be, would need to be embedded in the salary schedule and step increases are longevity. Employees move a step because they have successfully completed another year and then move on to the next step. Right. I think that they may have said it backwards, but if there's step increases, that's on your pay schedule. If you're a longevity patient, not be on your pay schedule. That should be in your MOU and labor agreement. I mean, if you put it on there, you, you can, but we, when we go to review it, we're going to review the pay schedule to make sure your pay rate meets, hits that right step, and then we're going to go into your MOU or labor agreement to see if the longevity is in there with the proper conditions and payments and all the other requirements. All right. Um, then closing on that, um, we do have, when we went to the Ed Forum, um, some of our team members did present on our MOU review mailbox. 
So I don't know if any of you are currently, or if you know a district that's currently engaging in labor agreement conversations, or updating your, or your labor agreements for any of your classifications. If you are, I would highly encourage you to utilize our mailbox. Um, we have worked through with a number of districts and also public agencies to better help them write, not really write, but guide them on language that would be less interpretable and actually something that we would not have a question for. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll do, we do find items of compensation that comes in and we can't clearly understand exactly what it is. And so it's a lot of back and forth conversations similar to this right now, where if we would have been part of the conversations when you enter into labor agreement um, and helped you kind of further clarify items of your MOU or special compensation, there won't be any questions or it should be very minimal questions after that. So we do have our MOU review mailbox. It's MOU underscore review at calpers.ca.gov. Um, I know we've sent it out, but we saw a lot of people use it between October and December, and recently we haven't seen very many inquiries coming through. So please utilize that, because we rather help educate you on what is perceivable and not perceivable um, before you sign off on any kind of labor agreement, and then all of a sudden you're saying, well, this is what we agreed to, and this is what we contracted for. Why are you guys not allowing it? Uh, and then we have to have those conversations where if we're engaged prior to you signing off on your MOU labor agreements, hopefully it, it is very um, compliant and therefore we will have to do less denials or have to actually engage in less conversations with what's report or not. So please take advantage of it. I mean, I know this sleep aid here is very um, comprehensive and it's very detail oriented. It's kind of language is not very clear. So if you are entering in kind of agreements or negotiations, utilize us. We have team members who we love to just say, we think maybe if you change this language a little bit, you're gonna be in more compliance, and therefore it will not set off red flags, right? Uh, versus us contacting you at time of retirement and saying, oh, your MOU is not very clear or it's not compliant, we're gonna deny this, and then what happens? Denial letters go out and everything else after that happens. So um, please use our team uh, to help you define your labor agreements. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Well, that concludes the CalPERS portion. I wanna thank each of you for taking your time out of the day to come here. Um, also like to thank our host, Cal Sturz. Thank you so much for making it easy for us. <laughs> um, before we go, we have a few events on the horizon we want to remind you of. Uh, Tuesday, uh, February 19th through the 24th, First is CalPERS Board Week. Um, it's never too early to talk about the Ed Forum. Next year's Ed Forum will be Oakland uh, Marriott City Center, mm -hmm. October 28th through the 30th. Um, and we'll see you here again May 1st. Thank you.